that believes in you, God, gets to worship you in spirit and in truth, God. We get to share your gospel, Lord. 
Lord, I'm so thankful that you're our comforter and you always hold us close, that you never just leave us or forsake us, God, that you are the one constant, that we are always changing and we may turn our backs on you, but you are always there, Lord God. So I give you, I just thank you. Lord, I ask that you cover, cover CSA this morning, Lord. Allow the speaker to speak your word, God. Use her, God. Talk through her, God. And I ask that you allow our ears to be open and our hearts to be responsive. And I ask that we not just leave what's spoken to us today here, Lord, but that we take it with us and we use it throughout the week and share it with someone else. I give you all the honor, the glory, and the praise in your son Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>
you know, we can make friends quick. So, like, you can meet somebody be like, oh, that's my girl, and then you, and she'd be in your wedding in a year, you know? So it's a chance for us to fellowship and get to know people, um, and we're going to be doing some games, some chit-chat, you know, we could talk. So come on out, have a good time. Um, it won't be super serious the whole time, too. We're going to have some fun, and we're also going to dive into the Word. So if you need a break, this is going to be completely different from studying. You can sit and talk and really be in community with each other, and you can feel refueled for the next week coming up. Thank you, ladies. So please, ladies, take out your phones and please scan the QR code because you want to see your come out in your numbers, okay? And please feel free to also share it with anyone in your tomb, yeah? Whether vet, uh, med, whatever your program. Please feel free to share it. So, upcoming events and reminders. So as we just mentioned, the International Women's Day Conference, March 8th. At 6 p.m., it will be at Bourne Hall. Um, we still also need people for our outreach team, so please feel free to contact any member of the e-board. Um, Ophiosa is actually heading it, so please feel free to reach out to her or any of the members of the e-board. And as usual, encountering God Worship Nights at 7.30 p.m. on Wednesday at Caribbean House. And... Uh, any prayer requests, please feel free to scan the QR code and make your um, request known, yeah? I would also like to call Mike. He will, um, wants to make an announcement. I'm going quick because I promised I'll say no more than two minutes. Uh, we have some gospel tracks in now. We've got 600 of them. And if you don't know what a gospel track, my generation knows all about them. Jehovah's Witnesses know about them because they give them out on the streets. But gospel tracts are for two types of people, those that are lost and those that are saved. For those that are lost, you can learn how to get saved by reading a gospel tract. Those who are saved can take a gospel tract and share it with someone. You can walk through the gospel real simple, real easy. Becoming a Christian is not hard for us. It was hard for the one who paid the price for us. Uh, we, they'll be over here. There's six different types. We have one, uh, Why Did Jesus Die? The Roman Road. There's some verses in, uh, uh, in Romans that'll, that you can use to share Christ with people. How to be saved. Uh, here's one. You'd use John 3.16 and walk through that. There are several different ones. And, you know, uh, people are taking information a little different than other people. So there's several different ways. Same message, different ways of delivering it. Another thing I'd like to implore to you is learn how to share your testimony in less than two minutes. I can do it in about 15 seconds. 59 years ago, I was raised in a Christian home, but 59 years ago, ago, I realized that I was lost and I was going to hell, and I didn't want to go. I asked my mother, Mom, I don't want to go to hell when I die. What do I do? She said, well, just ask Jesus to save you, and he will. So I knelt down in my bed, uh, next to my bed, and I said, Jesus, save me. It was the shortest sinner's prayer in the world, and uh, I've, I've been saved since 1965. Just that simple. You need to learn how to do that. You know, God spoke to you. I wasn't a drug addict. Drug addict. I, didn't, I wasn't a male prostitute. I wasn't all these other things. I was just a little boy who knew that he was lost and wanted to be saved. Another thing is, is learn how to share the gospel. I may run over my two minutes, but real quick. Uh, learn a way to do it short and simple. Mine is pray, P-R-A-Y. Problem is for P. The problem is sin. All of sin has fallen short of the glory of God. The results of that is death. For the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Answer is Jesus. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Your response is to receive him. Let's see if I can get this one right. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. And this, I'll stop there. Uh, I learned that as a dumb old electrician at 27 years old. I should have learned it as a 7-year-old. Learn how to share the gospel. Find something that works for you. And uh, that's my exhortation for the day. Thank you. Thank you. And as usual, the next QR code you will see coming up is for offering box as well as um, for t-shirts that we have at the back there. So please feel free to check it out after church. So I would like to welcome none other than Lisa Eberhardt to come and give the word today.
Good morning, CSA. Um, as Rebecca already mentioned, I'm Lisa. I'm a Term 2 medical student here, and I'll be sharing with you today. So before I begin, I'd like to start off with prayer. My Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Father, as I stand before here, ask that you give me strength. I can't do this alone, Father. Give me strength. Give me confidence. Rid me of myself. Use me as a vessel. Speak through me. Let it not be me, but you. Amen. So that's the title for today's sermon. Read your Bible. 66 chapters, two testaments, all in this book here that a lot of us carry around. Some in our tablets. I prefer the physical copy. Three words, simple instruction, read your Bible, yet so much meaning to it. Let's go. So my sermon is broken down into four parts. Why we need to read our Bible. We'll dive into the first part. It is our bread as Christians. Now let's open to the book of John. John 1, verse 1 to 4. It says, I want you to pay attention to, oh, I thought it was bolded, but there's bolded writing there, but yeah. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that was ever been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. So we've established here that there's a being that was with God, the Word. And that being, the Word, was God. When we go on to 32, it says, Jesus said to them, by the way, between the last scripture we read and 32, um, John tells us that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, which we know was Jesus. 32 says, Jesus said to them, Verily, truly, I tell you, it is not Moses who gives you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. That is Jesus. We, are, we go on to 35. It says, Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. We read further. It says, Verily, truly, I tell you, the one who believes has eternal life. And Jesus says once again, I am the bread of life. Before we analyze that, let's hop on to Deuteronomy 8.3. It says, He humbled you, causing you to hunger, and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had known, to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. So, so far, we've established that the word is equal to Jesus, who said he's the bread of life. And we know Jesus is not a man to lie. So if he says he is the bread of life, he is the bread of life. Scripture is filled with truth. Therefore, Deuteronomy tells us that we live not only by bread alone, the physical carbs that we eat, but by something more than that, by the word of God. And Timothy 2 tells us that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and it is prof profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Therefore, scripture is God's word. Therefore, we do not live by physical bread alone that we eat every day, be it burger spoke or glovers or whatever it is, but we live by the word of God. Now, some of us only read scripture or come across scripture on Sundays. And my question is, how many times do you eat in a day? Some that live good will say three, some two, some one. Um, I fall on one, if I remember. But the question is, how many times do you eat in a week? That is daily, right? Because we know the importance of eating. But if you're feeding your physical body every single day, why are you only feeding your spiritual body once a week? You are causing your spiritual body to be hungry. We know that in hunger comes starvation, starvation comes weakness. As a child of God, you are to feed your physical body more so 
feed your spiritual body. Next point. It's our instruction manual. Second, I mean, Philippians 2 verse 5 tells us, paraphrasing, as Christians, we are to model Jesus' way of life. He is our role model. He is the blueprint. We are new creations in Christ. If you do not get clarification or instruction from the Bible, you are prone to get it from the world. And we know we are not of this world. We are passengers just passing through. We are to sit, stick out like a sore thumb. The minute you see yourself conforming to the ways of the world, no child of God, that go back to the crossroads and rethink it again. Start afresh and read your Bible. Know what to do, what not to do. Romans 12, 2 tells us, And do not be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. When we read Proverbs again, it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he, not you, he will make your path straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. Do not listen to how you feel. Don't let how you feel or what you want to dictate how you go about life. Do not lean on your own understanding. Always go back to scripture. Ask for clarity. Pray. Get clarity from scripture. You know, the last time someone leaned on their own understanding and defined what was good by their own eyes. You know when that was? Genesis. Let's open Genesis. This is a fun one. Genesis 3.6, it says, so if you don't know, this is in the Garden of Eden. Um, God has created Adam. He told him, do not eat of the fruit. We know that that instruction was given prior to Eve being made, right? But then further down in 3 verse 6, it says, And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Eve had not heard the instruction of God. Isn't it funny that Eve found good in that which God said was evil? Prior to that, we know God said, this fruit is evil. If you eat it, it's the, um, the tree of knowledge, the good of good, good and evil. If you eat of this fruit, you will surely die. But here we have Eve, in her eyes, that very same tree that God said was a big no-no. It was good for food. It was pleasant to her eyes. It was to be desired. And it was going to make her wise. Didn't Proverbs just tell us to not be wise in our own eyes? Here we see Eve dictated what was good in her own eyes, what she wanted, and not what God said. When we do not listen, or we do not see or read what God says, we too will fall into the trap of defining good for ourselves. And we see what happened with Eve. She ate the fruit, and then everything just went downhill from there. So, brother and sister in Christ, do not be like Eve. Receive instruction from the Bible. Don't let what you feel or want dictate how you should live. Because in Christ, he's our blueprint and we follow what he says. There's only one place you can see or you can find how, God, how Jesus lived on this earth and is in scripture. If you hear about other people, they might paraphrase, they might lead you astray. But this is reliable. Man changes. The world says, do this. This is good for you. At first, they told us coconut oil was bad for you. Today, they tell you coconut oil is good for you. It's fickle. The world's fickle. But one thing has been unchanged through all the ages, and it is scripture. Stick to it. It's also funny how the world tells us this. And then when you read scripture, scripture says, no, no. The best example is the world tells you to follow your heart. Does it not? Follow your heart. Always. What your heart says, follow your heart. But when we read in Jeremiah 79, it says, The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. 
who can understand it? So we do not follow our hearts as Christians. We follow scripture. On to the next part. One of my favorites. It is a part of our armor. Armor, Lisa. War. Yes, it is war. Constantly in war. When we read the book of Ephesians 6.10, it says, Finally, be strong in the word and the mighty and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God, not one part, two parts, or three. Not today you feel like putting all of it, then tomorrow, five, part, five out of six. But all of it. And it is not our armor, it's God's armor. So put on the full armor of God so that you can stand, so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood but against rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of the stark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So Ephesians has now further clarified or divided or shown that we have physical bodies, flesh and blood, but we have spiritual bodies. We're war. We're constantly at war with our spiritual body, spiritually. 13 says, therefore put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything to stand. Now here, we know that in English, every time an author repeats something, it's for emphasis, right? He's emphasizing the importance. Tell me why. In 11, it says, put on the full armor of God. And then again, in 13, it says, therefore put on the full armor of God. One thing about scripture is stru the structure of it is impeccable. So I do not take it lightly that it is said twice in less than four scriptures down that put on the full armor of God. When we read further, it said, stand firm then with the belt of truth. This is the outfit of the day for a Christian. The belt of truth buckled around your waist, the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted, the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. 16 says, in addition to all of this, take up the shield of truth, which you shall extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take on the helmet of salvation. And last but not least, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Put on your armor daily. Put on your full armor daily. You wrestle not against flesh, but against spiritual wickedness. We are to always be alert and of sober mind. Bible tells us that our enemy, the devil, prowls aloud, around like a lion waiting for someone to devour. Child of God, don't let him find you when you are at your weakest. When you've decided today that it's just two parts you don't want to put on the full armor. When you haven't been in scripture and you do not have the sword of the Spirit. We see the sword of the Spirit being exercised in Luke 4 when we read Jesus being tempted in the wilderness. Let's turn to Luke 4 quickly. It says, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left for Jordan and led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them he was hungry. The devil said to him. Now I want you to realize that it said, at the end of them he was hungry. Then it mentions that the devil came to him and said. It came at his weakest point. The devil prowls around. So he's not going to wait for you at your strongest. He's going to be patient and wait for you to be found lacking. Let that day never come for you. The devil said to him, if you are the son of God, Tell the stone to become bread. Then Jesus answered, It is written. Bear in mind he's using scripture, which is the sword of the Spirit. He says, Man shall not live by bread alone. This we read earlier, Deuteronomy 8.3. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the, word, the mouth of God. The devil then led him up to a high place and showed him all in an instant the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all the authority and splendor. It has been given to me, and I can give it to you to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will all be yours. Then Jesus answered, It is written, Worship the Lord your God 
and serve him only. Then the devil said, I'm going to try one more time. He led him to Jerusalem and had him stand at the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here, for it is written. He will command your angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up with their hands so you will not strike your foot against a stone. Isn't it interesting also that the devil uses and no scripture? Then Jesus answered, it is said, using his spirit, I mean, the sword of the spirit. Do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished all this tempting, he left until an opportune time. Here we see Jesus constantly using the sword of the Spirit. He has put on his full armor. Even in weakness at his hungriest. Physically he was hungry, but spiritually he was fed. He was strong. He had his whole armor. Here we can also notice that the devil does one of three things. He either tests our knowledge of Scripture to see if you know indeed the Bible says that. You know, Hosea tells us that my people perish due to lack of knowledge. And we know Scripture says, know the truth and it shall set you free. Scripture is truth. The Word of God is truth. Know the Word of God and it will set you free. If the devil realizes that we know Scripture, what, he's, what does he do? He tests our understanding of Scripture. We see this in the second time he tempted Jesus. He quoted Scripture, but this time with malice behind. He was testing to see if Jesus really understood what that Scripture meant. Now that Scripture is for when you're in pain, troubles, that you should call upon your God. But it does not mean that you put yourself in a situation to call God to test him. Jesus understood that. So if the devil sees you know scripture, he will see if you understand that scripture. Jesus was wise enough to discern that, no, no, no. You're using that scripture out of context. You want me to use that scripture. I know it is correct scripture. But that's not, how it's, that's not what God meant. Furthermore, I will not test my God. If the devil does not test your knowledge, he will test your understanding. Lastly, he will test your obedience. You can know scripture, you can understand scripture, but do you obey scripture? We see there Jesus said, I will worship no God but the Lord alone. Are you knowledgeable enough, Understand, have an understanding of scripture, and obedient enough to follow scripture? Ramel came here a few, I think he shared a few Sundays ago, and he talked about the three types of Christian. There's one who reads scripture, there's one who reads and understands, and then there's one who reads and practices, who walks the talk. Be the third one. Know your scripture, understand it, and most importantly, obey it. On to our last point. It is how we know our Heavenly Father. When we open the first book in the Bible, it says, can anyone quote it? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Subject of the formula. I'm, I'm thinking maths. <laughs> Subject of the sentence, God. Let's turn to Revelation. The last scripture, it says, the grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's people about Jesus. Jesus is mentioned. God is mentioned. First scripture and last scripture. That means start to finish all of this is about God. Every story in the Bible is not to glorify David when he defeated Goliath. No, it is to glorify God. Everything in scripture leads to God. We start off all of Old Testament is building up to the coming, or the birth of Jesus. We see in the New Testament, he came. The New Testament tells us how he lived. Then he ascended, Acts tells us. And then after that, how us as the body of Christ live or should live. And then the last in Revelation tells us he's coming again. Nowhere in this Bible 
is God not the main character? The only way to know God is to read your scripture. But then why is it important to know God? It helps us understand who God is. Each book you read, you learn about God. It's the only way. Why do we need to know who God is? When we read scripture, it tells us to trust in God, to love him with all our heart and soul. Can you really trust a person or someone you do not know? Can you truly say you love someone you do not know? You can't, right? I can't walk up to IGA, give this a random man my phone, my card, and say, you know what, cherry on top, I'm going to go, I'm going to go in the car with you, trust you blindly with my life. You can't do that. So in the same way, when you say you trust God, but you, don't, you do not read scripture, you, don't know, you do not know who God is, are you saying you trust God because it makes you feel nice to say you trust God or they say, scripture says you should trust God or do you really mean it when you say you trust God? There's a difference in trusting God because they say trust him. But actually trusting him comes from knowing that he is faithful. And you'll know he is faithful by how consistently faithful he's been in scripture for everyone or every character in this holy book. Furthermore, to know how he speaks or his voice. You know, you hear a lot of people say, I don't know when God speaks. I don't know when I'm praying. I don't know if it's my thoughts, if it's someone else, if it's the devil's, if it's God speaking. But here's one thing. God's voice is always consistent with scripture. It will never deviate. So if you do not know scripture, you will not be able to discern whether it is God's voice or yours, if it's devil-influenced. In knowing scripture, only then can you be able to differentiate or discern that, no, this is God speaking or this is me speaking. Our thoughts are flesh-driven. Our thoughts satisfy our flesh. But God's word, God's voice is consistent with scripture. Furthermore, I always hear people saying, I know I should read my Bible, but you know, it's just, I just can't. I just, there's just something that stops me. I've summed it up into three. The first one, and this one hits home for me. It condemns you. The minute you are out of line as a Christian and you open scripture, Scripture will tell you, no, no. And a lot of us don't want that. We don't want the, the discipline. We don't want to be told you're in the wrong. So instead, we avoid it. We stick to the world. We listen to the world because there, they condone or the world condones our behavior. But Scripture will not. The Word of God will not. I read something on Instagram. It said, the Word of God will hurt you with the truth, but it will never comfort you with a lie. And that is fact. It is a mirror. It will show you if you're in the wrong or if you're in the right. Now, don't be so hard-headed. Don't be so prideful to acknowledge that you're in the wrong, to acknowledge that you have made a mistake. You know, the, the thing behind Christianity, surrender, humility. Be humble enough to acknowledge that you are in the wrong. Jesus says, this is the way. And furthermore, obey what he says. Because you, Jesus said, those that love me, obey me. The second one is, we say we don't have time. We have so much going on in our lives. It's just, he said, I really don't have the time. But here, when we read uh, Luke 21, 4, let me see how time is. Do I have time to read Luke 21, 4? Okay. Thank you. Okay, Luke 21, 4, titled The Widow's Offering. As Jesus looked up, he saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury. He also saw a poor widow put in two very small copper coins. This is Jesus speaking. Truly, I tell you, he said, 
This poor widow has put in more than all the others. All these people gave their gifts out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put all she had to live on. Here we can see that Jesus wants all, as much as you can. It does not mean 40, it does not mean 23 out of 24 hours of the day you give him, but as much time as you can. If that day is two hours, then so be it. But let it not be when you're on holiday and you're binge watching House or Grey's Anatomy, only decide to give scripture 15 minutes. Because then you become like the wealthy people that probably had five million but gave an offering of 20 grand. Be like the widow who had the two copper coins and gave it her all. Give him all. He wants all. But remember that Jesus knows you're in medical school. He knows you're in vet. He knows you're in um, school of arts and sciences. So he's aware. But there, prioritize him and give him as much as you can. So you never can say you don't have enough time because that little you have is what God, what Jesus wants. The last one is usually you don't see the need to read scripture. But I think I've given you enough points earlier to see that there is need because it's your instruction manual. It is a part of your armor and it is how you know your God. Now we've established why it is important to read and why we do not. But then how should we read scripture? This is based off how I read scripture. First and foremost, I pray before I begin. I ask for releva- revelation. <laughs> revelation. Revelation. <laughs> Sorry, it reminds me of a TikTok I saw earlier. The lady, <laughs> the lady was eating a pomegranate and she was like, uh, what did she say? Oh, forgot. I'm sorry. I'll remember. But yeah, <laughs> ask for revelation from the Holy Spirit. Because we know he's our helper. John, in John, the book of John tells us that he is our helper. So ask God, please, as I read your word, reveal to me what you want to be revealed. Help me understand what you want me to understand. Second, read scripture to understand. Don't say, This month I'm supposed to read the book of Genesis, so that means six chapters. I can't do the math, but six chapters a day. And then you just browse through. No. Read to understand. Use your resources. Go on Google. Read some commentary. Go on YouTube. Ask at Bible study. Ask a fellow friend. What do you understand from this? What do you read to understand? Because we've seen that if you do not read to understand, you'll be easily swayed or persuaded by the devil. The third one is to meditate on Scripture. Deuteronomy tells us, meditate on my word daily. Meditate on Scripture, let it marinate in you, so you sweat Scripture, you breathe Scripture, you speak Scripture, everything you do, let it be Scripture-driven. Bible also tells us, that a bad tree cannot bear good fruit, nor can a good tree bear bad fruit. So if your tree is scripture, you will bear scripture. If it's anything else, then you will bear whatever that is. Number four is included in your prayers. That's you practicing it. When we include scripture in our prayers, oftentimes we're not reminding God of who he is, but we're reminding ourselves of who God is. We see it... um, I think it was Hannah. Someone was praying somewhere, sorry. And she said, Lord of hosts. Because at that moment, she needed the Lord of hosts. There are times when we need Jehovah Jireh. We know he's our provider, and that's the one we go to. We say, God, why does it seem like you do not see my struggle? At that point, you call Jehovah El Roy, the one who sees El Sali, El Suri, whoever the name of God you need from Scripture, because you've read in Scripture that this is the same God who took the Israelites out of Egypt, who fed them manna, 
who led them to the promised land. He's the one with no qualification made David as great as he is. He's that same God. The last one is walk the talk, which we said earlier. It's important to obey. Bible does say, those that love me obey my word. Don't just read scripture to know scripture, to boast that you know scripture. Read it so you walk it. Read it to understand. Use it as an instruction, as the blueprint for your life. Let it sustain you because you do not live by bread alone but by scripture, by the word of God, because it sustains you. In the book of Matthew, we read, heaven and earth will fade, heaven and earth will pass away, but his word will always remain. And that's on facts. Everything may crumble, but lean on his word, lean on him, his word will always be there. It's easy to begin like today and say, I'm going to read scripture. The hardest part is remaining consistent. You know, (laughs) it's like gym. Day one, you post, I'm speaking to myself. You go on the treadmill, you post day one or uh, one day or day one. Fitness journey started. Day four, I'm like, ah, ah. (laughs) same with scripture reading your bible it's hard to remain consistent but you see how essential it is discipline yourself to read scripture discipline yourself because the benefits there are no cons to this the only con would probably be growing as a christian improving in your work with walk with christ loving god more and i don't know that seems like pros to me As a baby in Christ, it is essential to marinate in Scripture. That's how you grow closer to God. That's how you know your God. That's how you start loving your God. You love someone the more time you spend with them. Because oftentimes, the reason why we love someone more because we spent a lot of time with them is because those attributes that are beautiful are revealed when we spend time with them. I can't start loving you because of what you told me you are. But in time, I will see that those attributes are pretty something amazing. And you'll see it when you spend time in Scripture. You'll see that God is faithful. God is so good. Because there's so many times I'm like, you know what? These Israelites, I don't know. I felt like if I was God, I would have been like, I cut, cut the show. Let's end the show here. Mankind is just, no. But it, it's in that... You see that as an individual, I'm fickle. Tomorrow I'm for God, tomorrow I'm not. But because he's the same God who gave that grace to the Israelites, he's the same God who gives you grace daily. It's the reason you are here today, smiling, despite your little you know, meandering that you do. With that, I conclude. Dear child of God, Scripture. Read your Bible. It is essential. It is your bread. It is your instruction manual. It is a part of your armor. And most importantly, it's how you know your Father. Thank you.
continue to learn more about you and grow closer to you every day. God, I pray that you'd bless us as we go throughout the rest of our day with exams and prevent midterms, and that we, everything we do would just bring you glory and honor forever. You're worthy of all the glory and the honor and the praise forever. In your name I pray, amen. Amen. running after me your goodness is running after it's running 
Oh, so-